we conclude our sermon series on generosity this morning by focusing on the Gospel of Luke and the famous story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. It's a story about generosity, but it comes to the point in a way we may not expect. So hear now these words from a story we may have heard when we were growing up in Sunday school or in vacation Bible school. Chapter 19 of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see Jesus, because he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw this began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, and I, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. And then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Well, this is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. And let's be in prayer together. O Lord, create in us grateful hearts and put generous spirits in us. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. One of the classic American tales and most watched movies of all times is The Wizard of Oz. It is one of my favorites. Do you remember the end of the movie with Dorothy, the scarecrow, the tin man, and the cowardly lion? They have returned from their seemingly impossible task of capturing the broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West. They have completed their mission, and now they want to redeem the promise made to them by the wizard. Only we find out that the wizard cannot really grant their wishes. And we also find out that he doesn't really need to anyway because all three of Dorothy's companions already have the qualities they are seeking. They just didn't have the confirmation of those qualities. So the great and powerful Wizard of Oz bestows upon Dorothy's three companions special gifts. He says to the Scarecrow, Therefore, by virtue of the authority invested in me by the universitas, <laughs> universitas, I can't say this word, Universita, universitatis, committitatum e pluribus unum. You say that five times. <laughs> I hereby confer upon you the honorary degree of THD. And do you remember what THD stands for? Doctor of Thinkology. The cowardly lion also receives a medal to which the wizard says, Therefore, 
for meritorious conduct, ext extraordinary valor, conspicuous bravery against wicked witches, I award you the Triple Cross. You are now a member of the Legion of Courage. And finally, to the Tin Man, a large red heart-shaped watch made of metal that hangs from the end of a golden chain. The wizard says to the Tin Man, good deed doers have got, have one thing you have not got, and that's a testimonial. And therefore, in consideration of your kindness, I take pleasure in presenting you with a small token of our esteem and affection. And in all three cases, the scarecrow, the tin man, and the cowardly lion thought they lacked something, intellect, courage, heart, only to realize they were wrong. Each of them proved that they had the qualities they were seeking inside of them from the very beginning. They just had not looked deep enough. How easy it is to draw similar conclusions about our own faith and about the spiritual qualities we need to express that faith. We don't think sometimes we have what it takes to do what God wants us to do, only to be surprised by what we can do by God's grace. Over the last three weeks, we have been sharing a similar message. We may not realize how deep within us there is a generous spirit. We may not think of ourselves in such a light, but there is. We have been created to be loving and generous by a loving and generous God. We also may not have considered the emotional and physical benefits of expressing gratitude or how an attitude of gratitude can change our whole outlook on life. But we have learned over the last few weeks that these connections are real and they are provable. Indeed, we may not have recognized the deep connections between prayer and courage and taking more time to listen to God rather than always making a request of God. But we want to invite everyone here to willfully pray, Lord, your servant is listening. What would you have me to do? So like a child in the back seat of a car on vacation, we all may want to ask this morning, are we there yet? What comes next in our generosity journey? Well, what comes next is how we respond to all God is doing for us and in us. What comes next is a matter of loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. What comes next is about trusting God and having faith in God's purposes, even when we may not fully understand those purposes. For example, in his second letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says and speaks of walking by faith, not by sight. Paul's statement here is about trusting God to lead us even when we may not see the whole landscape. It's not a statement about not knowing who God is or what we, supposed, or we are supposed to do as God has revealed that in Christ. Rather, it's a statement about the power of faith in getting us to where we are going and how God is working on our behalf to get us there. I think this is very similar to what the preacher in the letter to the Hebrews says about faith being the assurance of things hoped for, 
the conviction of things not seen. We're not able to see all God's doing, but we can be assured that God is doing all God can do on our behalf. God is working for our good. In other words, it is by faith that we are able to do what we don't think is possible. And in terms of generosity, that means giving or sharing or serving in ways that may surprise even us. I make that statement because I feel on occasion we may feel as if we have done enough. We may think we cannot do one more thing until the Holy Spirit grabs us and whispers to us, there's more. And I will show you. Trust me. Think of Jesus' miracle of feeding the 5,000. The disciples saw only a crowd. They saw only a little boy with two fish and five loaves of bread. They didn't want to deal with the people. They wanted to see the people leave. But Jesus saw the occasion as a way of pouring out God's blessings upon the multitude, giving them more than they imagined. It's a reminder, dear friends, that God's generosity is always extravagant generosity <clears throat> and an in indicator of what can happen when we allow God to use us, to surprise us. Now let's look at our passage this morning. The passage of Zacchaeus and Jesus. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and on his way, he goes through the little town of Jericho. And it's in Jericho that he spots a wee little man called Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is up in the sycamore tree. Zacchaeus is wealthy. He's rich. But he's also a tax collector. But he's too short to see over the crowds, and so hence he climbs the tree to catch a glimpse of Jesus coming down the road. More than one commentator has suggested, in more ways than one, that Zacchaeus is up a tree, literally and figuratively. That is to say, he's short. Sorry, short people. But he's a tax collector. That means he's a traitor to Israel. And Israel doesn't like traitors. Third, he's a sinner. Not good. More importantly, though, with respect to this story, is that Jesus has his eyes on Zacchaeus. Jesus sees something in him that others do not. He spots Zacchaeus in the tree, and then he invites himself, get this, he invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house for dinner. So much for getting out the invites. But it's Jesus' self-invitation that raises the eyebrows of the crowd. Jesus' self-invite offends the crowd. See, the people say, they're grumbling. He is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Not only does dem Jesus demonstrate bad manners, by making room for himself at Zacchaeus' home, but he has crossed a shameful boundary. By identifying with a person whose own actions were suspect and despicable, all of which is offensive. But get this, Zacchaeus himself is also offended by the crowd and it's 
his reaction to them that's also important. Zacchaeus, says Luke, remained standing during all this. We may say, well, there's nothing with that. Oh, yes, there is. By saying that he's standing there, Luke wants us to know that he has had enough of the crowd's grumbling. Do you follow? He's not going to take it anymore. And so he's defending himself by standing up against the crowd. And by standing up against the crowd, he does something unimaginable. What does he do? He opens his pocketbook. That's odd, isn't it? It's as if Zacchaeus is saying to the crowd, take that. I'm going to show you. I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor. And then I'm going to pay back anyone I've defrauded four times. What do the kids call it? A mic drop? Boom. Because in a matter of seconds, generosity is being practiced. Not as some future financial plan, but as a change of heart. So much so that Jesus says these famous words, salvation has come to this house. Who would have thought? Zacchaeus, a traitor, transformed into the son of Abraham. Can't appearances be deceiving? Who can really read the human heart? It's another way of saying we really don't know how the Spirit is moving among us or how the Spirit is touching the person next to you this morning because the Holy Spirit blows where it wills. Look at Zacchaeus. Who would have expected the Holy Spirit to touch him? However, if we've been paying attention over the last few weeks, we would have seen something similar with the leper who returned to show gratitude. Who would have thought? But again, we never know how hearts are going to be changed, especially with respect to generosity and gratitude. Share with you a memory. Years ago, there was a pastor in the South Indiana Conference by the name of Chuck Armstrong. Chuck was a pastor to many of us. He had so much pastoral wisdom. And he shared a word of wisdom with me one day of how to go about teaching giving and generosity. He said, Andy, people will always protect their pocketbooks. But that doesn't mean you don't send the message to appeal to the heart anyway. And I think that raises a question. What is it about the connection between transformation and generosity? Between salvation and gratitude? Jesus obviously wants us to see the connection that there is something about the condition of a grateful and generous heart that can make all the difference in the world, regardless of status. In other words, transformation happens when a grateful heart meets a saving God. Transformation happens when a grateful heart meets a saving God. That's when we see change. We see how God seals the deal. A person goes out or goes from looking out only for oneself to see how they can make a difference in the lives of others. In the Methodist tradition, that's what we mean by sealed by the Spirit. We're marked as a child of God because the Holy Spirit takes a hold of us and we become God's own child. 
fulfilling our baptismal vows, bearing the fruit of the Spirit. So let me ask you now some questions. Having shared over the last few weeks, reading your devotions, listening to the messages, reading what others have shared about generosity, can you imagine the Lord using your gifts and your graces, your time and your talent to transform those around you, to help those around you? What is Christ wanting you to do? How might the Holy Spirit be nudging you or wanting to surprise you? Questions for self-examination are very important but perhaps more important is prayer. And here's our prayer. That God would create in us grateful hearts and put generous spirits in us. May we pray that prayer for direction and so demonstrate extravagant generosity.